Our debris contractors will make multiple passes throughout the parish. So continue to ensure that your debris uh, as we navigate this present event. Uh, once we get through this, we want you to make sure that your debris is certainly sorted properly. And we have all the information you need about debris removal at brla.gov slash recovery. As of last week, we've got all the trees cleared from the roadways. We've got our tra uh, traffic signals restored. And uh, we will continue to work with our local, state, and federal partners to coordinate and conduct um, our community sites, which we did do post Hurricane Ida. In fact, we distributed 15,000 meals, thousands of bags of ice and pear pallets of water. We exchanged over 100 oxygen tanks. We offered our residents a place to recharge their devices and rest in the AC as they waited for power. And so as we move past this phase of our recovery, we want to um, make sure that you remain, one of my top goals is to remain, uh, ensure that you remain equipped with the tools that you need. And so tonight, we had already planned to gather our partners to talk about and answer any questions that you may have to add clarity to post-Hurricane Ida um, recovery. Um, I will tell you, let me give you an update on Tropical Storm Nicholas before we continue. Our city parish team is closely monitoring the situation. At this point, we have closed all city parish buildings, including City Hall and our community centers. And we did this out of an abundance of caution. Our main concern, of course, right now is the potential for flash flooding. We've received one to five inches of rainfall over the last two days with varying amounts in different areas of the parish. And so we're currently forecasted to receive an additional eight to 10 inches of rainfall with locally higher amounts, possibly today through 7 a.m. on Friday. So we will remain under a flash flood watch through Thursday morning. Current forecasts are expecting five to seven inches of rainfall between tonight and tomorrow morning. DPW is reporting that our drainage systems are working, but please be mindful of high, a high volume of rain that can fall in a short period of time, which may take some time for our pumps to process, but please, I know you won't, and I want you to encourage your neighbors and friends. We're telling everybody, do not drive through any flooded streets. When in doubt, we want everyone to turn around. Remember, you can opt in to city uh, parish updates by texting Red Stick Ready. That's 225-243-9991, Red Stick Ready, 243 9991 and you can find up to date emergency information at brla.gov/emergency. And with that I am going to hand it over to um, Clay Reeves, the director of the mayor's office of homeland security and emergency preparedness and he is going to offer more information on our recovery from Ida and our outlook for tropical storm Nicholas. Clay. Thank you, Mayor. So, as the mayor mentioned, we have uh, prepared for Nicholas. We have our uh, first responders on standby. They have uh, they're in the around the parish. We have um, all the assets we would need in case the storm does affect us. Uh, we will activate a small activation here at our East Baton Rouge Parish Emergency Operations Center, where we will monitor that storm overnight. As the mayor mentioned, it, uh, the storm will be coming in at night, so we're hoping everyone stays out of harm's way. Uh, if it does get bad, we will definitely be in posture to to respond to it immediately. Um, in regard to Hurricane Ida, so the, in emergency management here at the mayor's office, of Homeland Security Emergency Preparedness, MOSEP, 
Uh, we're at a local level, so you normally hear local, state, and federal level. So um, just a little quick uh, briefing on on how we we operate in the emergency management world. So um, MOSAP works very closely with the cities of, of Baker, Zachary, and Central, and the city parish, as well as our unincorporated areas with our with our fire districts, as well as our sheriff's office. So we're a coordinating agency. So we coordinate with all the different agencies to ensure that we have a seamless uh, response to any type of disaster. During Ida, we uh, had a lot of high winds that came through. We had a lot of trees down, like the mayor mentioned, and a lot of damage. And we were uh, constantly in in um, response mode. So once the storm goes away, we transition to recovery, which we are where we are today. Um, so we have uh, individuals on the on the call today with us from the state and our federal partners. So when I mentioned MOSEP, we're, we're uh, during recovery, it's locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. So what does that mean? So we work very closely with the state of Louisiana, GOSEP, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, that oversees all the different or coordinates with all the different state agencies, and then um, we then. The federally supported part is FEMA comes in and they have all their different agencies. We have many of those on the phone uh, on the call tonight that will can answer your questions and they open up different programs. Once we receive um, the, uh, the support um, from the president through our presidential declaration, which we have received. Um, so tonight, um, you know, again, working with our state and federal partners, you're going to hear pro about programs for individual assistance, public assistance, uh, expedited rental assistance, uh, critical needs assistance, transitional shelter assistance, Operation Blue Roof, and the message I just received right when this call was starting with DSNAP, Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, that has been approved. So we have uh, subject matter experts in each of these areas that can field any questions that you may have. So by the end of the call, you, you should um, you should be well informed. And if for some reason, which I doubt, but if for some reason we can't answer your call, we will make sure we follow up with an answer. Um, so tonight, I'm, I'm, um, I have some representatives from uh, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Parents. Mr. Darren Guidry is on the phone, uh, as well as Casey Tingle, uh, Darren is a, a individual that comes to our office. He's one of the uh, the regional coordinators that that we work directly with, and we're very fortunate tonight to have Mr. Casey Tingle, who will uh, give you a, a little introduction and a little uh, information about the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Parents. He's the Deputy Director and Chief of Staff. Casey, thank you, Clay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you, and. Uh, thank you, Mayor, President Broom, and, and your team for your partnership on this event, just like we've seen uh, through so many uh, different events over the past uh, year and, and a half. Um, on behalf of the state and, and the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, uh, our role really is to help coordinate um, between our federal partners and all of our parish and local partners. Um, as it relates to preparing for, responding to, and recovering from uh, events like we've seen. Uh, so with Hurricane Ida, um, our job is to help facilitate that process, and whether it's resources that the parish needs uh, in terms of things like sandbags or bottled water or whatever those commodities or other needs might be. Uh, we also work very closely with the city parish um, on sheltering. Uh, both for residents uh, supporting, help supporting sheltering for residents, as well as uh, being partners to our sister parishes that were impacted. So we've been uh, doing a lot with the sheltering piece. Uh, I, I do want to talk about the recovery part. So uh, certainly there are some experts on from FEMA, and we want to encourage everyone to apply for that FEMA assistance uh, and work through that process. It can be uh, frustrating at times and, and, and maybe confusing, and, but we want to con, uh, you know, encourage everyone to, to work through that process um, and to pay very close attention to um, the correspondence that FEMA sends out. Uh, and if you, uh, through individual assistance, get an award uh, for repair for your home, 
uh, or uh, an award for rental assistance. Pay very close attention to those letters so that you understand what that funding is for. Um, because it's very important that you document those costs and you keep your receipts and things like that. Um, so in general, our role is just to help facilitate this process to make sure that information is provided timely and that any programs that the federal government has that could be helpful uh, to our uh, residents and those impacted by weather events like Hurricane Ida are turned on. And we're very happy to report that very quickly after Hurricane Ida, uh, President Biden approved the major disaster declaration that made these types of assistance available. And we'll continue to work with our parish and local partners uh, to be able to provide any help that we can and to facilitate this process as we move forward. So Clay, I'll turn it back over to you and really appreciate the opportunity to, to share uh, a little bit of the state's uh, participation in this. And on behalf of all the state partners that work with you and your team uh, and have so for, for many years, we appreciate your partnership. Thank you, Casey. And Casey and I have been in a lot of communication lately um, with the different programs. Uh, the, uh, the mayor met with the governor and met with uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and, and FEMA partners uh, looking uh, for the Operation Blue Roof program to be uh, eligible here in East Baton Rouge Parish. And that has been recently approved. And uh, tonight I have a Lieutenant Colonel uh, Robert Green from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, who will talk a little bit more. We'll talk a little bit about the Blue Roof program. And then uh, after this is uh, over, um, there will be probably some questions for him. So we'll field those at that time. So Lieutenant Colonel Green. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to join in uh, on your discussion here tonight. Uh, so just a, a quick overview of the Blue Roof program. Um, so this is a program uh, that is federally funded to provide temporary roofing for uh, roofs and for homes or residences that have been damaged through the hurricane. Um, so it's a multi-step process. The first step in the process, if you uh, believe you are needing assistance, is to register your request for assistance. So there are two primary ways to do that. Uh, the first is to go on to the website blueroof.us. That's blueroof.us, and you can fill out a request for assistance there. Uh, alternatively, you can call our uh, call center, and the phone number for that is 1-800-ROOF-BLUE. So that's 1-800-766-3258. And either one of those ways you can use to uh, get your residents uh, registered for support. Uh, once we've received the registration, uh, it will go into our queue of all the requests we've received. Uh, we have quality assurance reps from the Corps of Engineers who review each and every one of those, and we'll turn that into a work order for one of our contractors uh, to get out there locally and install the temporary roof housing or roof over your housing. Um, currently, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, this parish has been included in the roofing support for Louisiana. Uh, to date, uh, as of last night, we had received 292 requests for support uh, from the parish. So uh, as those continue to increase, uh, we will absolutely work to turn those into work orders as quickly as possible and then get them over to the contractors for execution. Uh, if there are any other questions on the program, uh, I'd be more than willing to stay in line and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And just for the folks on the call, um, obviously, if you have damage to your home, uh, try to um, repair that to um, no other damage is caused by uh, any um, rain that we may have between now and the time that the Operation Blue Roof folks um, could come out. Um, call, and the, really the process would be call your insurance company, take pictures, uh, patch what you can patch or have someone patch it. The Blue Roof program is really a, an excellent uh, material that they put on um, and then that would allow you a little more time to have a roofing company come and repair your roof with with shingles. We do know that there's a lot of demand right now and the roofing supply is low. So uh, this is a great opportunity if that if that's needed. So um, 
Next, uh, I went to uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now I'll move on back to the state. Um, I have a assistant uh, secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS, Ms. Shavana Howard. Um, she will give you an update on the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Good evening and thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here to provide an update on how DCFS can help with the SNAP benefits. Um, <clears throat> as of today, we actually received formal approval for disaster SNAP benefits um, for 25 parishes that you'll see on the screen that were approved through the FEMA individual assistance. Um, for individuals who are already on SNAP, they are not eligible for DSNAP and they shouldn't apply. Um, we did already do a replacement benefit for all SNAP households at 55% of their August benefit rate. So SNAP households need not apply. It's only for individuals who are not already receiving SNAP benefits. Um, we will start operating our DSNAP event um, starting on Monday. This will be a virtual event in, in hopes of keeping everyone safe from uh, and being able to social distance. We recognize and realize that there'll be um, a lot of people applying for DSNAP just because it was such a, a large and widespread event. Um, and as such, we're gonna operate in three different phases. Um, phase one, which will start on Friday, or I'm sorry, on September 20th, which is Monday, and run through Saturday, um, will uh, house all of those in East Baton Rouge, East Feliciana, Iberia, Orleans, Point Capi, St. Bernard, St. Tammany, Washington, West Baton Rouge, and West Feliciana. You'll see on the screen here, day one through four are um, our only days that we will sign, we will only interview individuals with the last names as follows. Day five and six, which is always a Friday and Saturday, is when we will actually open up to all letters of the alphabet. Um, we will be operating uh, our call center to take all of these calls. Um, Monday through Saturday from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, this is our phase two schedule. I won't go over all of these parishes, but these are parishes not including in um, East Baton Rouge, but these are the other parishes that will be operating in our phase two, which is the week following. Um, and this will be the same alphabets A through Z are the first four days, and the last two days are always open to all alphabets. And then you will see here um, our third phase, which is uh, Lafourche and St. Charles, St. James, St. John the Baptist, and Terrebonne, which um, are slowly starting to recover and um, don't all yet have uh, power. Um, and so they we are choosing to operate them in phase three. Um, you should know that in order for the state to operate a DSNAP, we do have to make sure that uh, parishes have uh, power electricity, that they have connectivity. Um, that they have mail that can be delivered and that they have um, grocery stores that are open. Those are the requirements that FNS looks at for us to um, approve parishes for DSNAP benefits. So what do we do now? So now we're asking for um, everyone to actually pre-register in our portal. Once we actually go live starting on Monday to apply and to interview, you only have to call in to LA Help You, the number is on the screen, like I said earlier, between 7.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. On your designated day, unless you call in on a Friday or a Saturday, and you can call in um, any time on those days. So now we're asking for individuals to pre-register at the www.dcfs.la.gov slash pre-register. Um, and you do not have to be pre-registered in order to receive DSNAP, but you do have to have an interview or an application in order to receive DSNAP. So pre-registration is just the first step. Please make sure that you still call in on those dates that I shared to actually have your interview conducted. Um, pre-registering will allow us to send out notifications to you um, of when, uh, when uh, almost like a reminder of uh, when your alphabet is open for um, interviews and or if our call volume is so low, we will open up to all in the alphabet and you would get that if you, you would receive that message if you were actually pre-registered um, for DSNAP. In the meantime, while we have a few days before our DSNAP event starts, we ask that you start gathering all the documents that you'll need to make it an easier and smoother process. 
Um, you'll need uh, the items that are listed here on the screen um, and our representatives that will go over all of this in detail with you on the phone. Um, and you'll, you, you'll know before you get off the call if there's additional information that is needed and or if you are approved for benefits um, at that time. Um, we do ask um, to help with the identity and residency ver verification process so that you don't have to send that information in. We do ask that you download LA Wallet um, at the LAWallet.com so that we can verify your identity and residency. It does help to speed up the interview process. Um, and if you want more information, you can always uh, contact or visit our website at dcfs.la.gov slash dsnap or text LA dsnap to 898 211. Um, just a reminder, if you're already on SNAP benefits, you are not eligible for DSNAP benefits. As I said earlier, we did issue replacement benefits to those parishes that were impacted, which included individuals in East Baton Rouge period, East Baton Rouge Parish. So those uh, SNAP clients who were already on SNAP benefits did already receive um, an additional benefit amount at 55% of what their normal August, um, yeah, their normal August benefit amount was. Um, so SNAP recipients in other parishes um, that are not included in that 25 or not included in this 18, I'm sorry, that you see on the screen. If you did have a power outage that was more than 24 hours, you can apply individually um, online, complete a replacement benefit form at the website on the screen, and we'll be more than happy um, to look into your case and potentially, if you're eligible, issue out SNAP replacement benefits. We have several resources uh, um, that you all will have access to. We can definitely put it in the chat here if we need to. Um, we have a, a few one pagers on um, food aid that includes the DSNAP pro, uh, process that we're talking about, as well as information on the hot food waiver, which we got approved. Um, on the probably the second day of Ida, which allows individuals who are who have SNAP, DSNAP, and or PEBT benefits to actually purchase hot and prepared food, which typically are not approved um, during a regular SNAP for regular SNAP benefits. Um, we also have a one pager that will go over some of the same information that I shared, with some additional um, uh, flexibilities that the department has taken in hopes of helping people during this dire time. Um, in addition to replacing benefits and and doing the hot and prepared foods, uh, the state did all also um, submit and receive approval from the federal government to waive all interviews for individuals who are applying for SNAP for the SNAP program. So um, if you're applying for SNAP, if you are doing a, a redetermination or eligibility review for SNAP, you will not have to have an interview conducted and you will actually just send your information in and we will determine eligibility and or reach out to you if we have questions on your application or your review. I think that's all that I have to share, but if you have any questions, I'll be open for those now. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that information. So now I wanna introduce uh, Melissa Wilkins with the FEMA Office of External Affairs. She'll go over just a, a briefing of the federally supported activities that we have been mentioning. Uh, Melissa. Good evening. I'm joined tonight with members of the congressional staff, as well as subject matter experts with hazard mitigation, public administration, individual assistance, and SBA. Thank you so much for having us tonight. We look forward to helping the state and the citizens recover. All right, so we have um, again, we have all the subject matter experts from the different departments uh, from FEMA. Um, so at this time, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in that just a brief overview of. of um, the agencies that you represent and really uh, I'll turn the floor back over to the mayor president and to go through some some questions. very much. So um, now we will um, go over some of the questions that we re have received and we're gonna ask our subject matter experts to respond. Uh, first of all, 
how can FEMA provide generator chainsaw reimbursement to everyone, even those with insurance in the affected areas, since these are necessary to survive after a hurricane? The FEMA online app does not allow this reimbursement if a person has insurance. Um, hello, my name is Barbara Sedana and I'm with uh, FEMA IA uh, deployed to this disaster. And um, I wanted to touch on a couple of points about generators to answer the question and then perhaps go a little bit beyond that um, to answer additional questions that have that have come up. Um, first of all, for this disaster, uh, oh, and, and thank you, Mayor, for having us here. Uh, I was on your call last night and I applaud your commitment to your uh, constituents and, and how communicative you are. So uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, so um, with the uh, generators, uh, what I was gonna say is one of the things that the state and FEMA did in partnership is they stood up a lot of uh, waivers uh, to some of the regular guidelines and they they provided some expedited assistance and various assistance programs that, that aren't uh, always able to be provided. Uh, given the circumstances, the magnitude of this disaster and the uh, extensive power outage, that just prompted a lot of really quick action and uh, um, some great opportunities for assistance. One of the things with uh, generators and chainsaws, but primarily generators, let's say, is that typically there is a uh, medical requirement uh, uh, for reimbursement for generators. And that's one of the things that was waived. Um, there is also no insurance uh, factor as far as generator eligibility. I think that's been a little bit of confusion. Um, folks are, are getting notices uh, about insurance related to FEMA's housing assistance. Uh, and, and because I think maybe our, our messaging could probably be tweaked a little bit, it has been interpreted to mean that insurance is a factor for uh, reimbursement for generators purchased after the disaster. So I uh, just am here to clarify that that, that isn't a factor. Uh, we don't look at whether or not you have insurance when we're uh, uh, reviewing the case to provide reimbursement for generator. Um, another question that has come up about generators, uh, again, a little bit beyond what the uh, uh, question was that was posed, is um, that's also not at all related to SBA. Um, uh, SBA, uh, there are some categories, and I see uh, Mr. Kamar on the line, um, and he can answer SBA questions, and I don't want to go too far into his territory. So let me just kind of quit by saying that um, we don't look at gener or we don't look at SBA all either with regard to reimbursing for generators. So it's really a, a matter of. Uh, if you registered and expressed you had essential utilities out or you did have a miscellaneous other expense, then uh, that prompts the case for review. But even beyond that, the state is uh, and FEMA are reaching out to folks that may not have uh, interpreted that in the registration process and just giving them another opportunity saying, here's a request for information and if you want to submit your uh, generator uh, purchase or rental receipts, and it provides instructions how to do that. So I know that was a long answer, but I'm thinking that there were other generator related questions, and I thought I would kind of combine them and address them all together. Thank you. And Mike. I'm glad I'm glad you did because you're correct. There were other generator related questions, and I'm not trying to simplify what you said, uh, but trying to summarize. So basically. Most of the questions were concerns around the ability uh, to receive a reimbursement for a generator, uh, whether you have insurance or not. And so uh, what you're telling me is that there is the potential to receive that reimbursement, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and thank you for summarizing. My friends have to do that for me all the time. Lots of words, and then they they put it what I've just said into like five or six, and it makes perfect sense. So thank you. That's exactly. And, and if they want to seek the reimbursement, 
they should go uh, to, um, we're going to put the, the link up where they should go. There's a link, correct? Um, there, there's a couple of opportunities um, for folks that have uh, primarily, well, or initially, if you register online, you get an immediate opportunity to set up an online account. Uh, and But people that register by phone can also set up an online account and they can upload their generator receipts directly into their FEMA online account. But if, if that's not, um, uh, you know, an, uh, a good option for them, um, if I, I don't know if I can put it in the chat, but I can provide the FEMA fax number and people are also able to fax their generator receipts and they will um, go into their FEMA file and be reviewed by a caseworker uh, on a, a, you know, in the order they're received. Okay, that's fine. Now to the next question. Um, we have evacuated to a hotel in Houston um, since the forecast had the storm coming over East Baton Rouge Parish. Will this be reimbursed? Thank you. Stacy. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, good. Melissa? I was just saying for that question and wanted to see if Stacy was available. Okay. Hi, Melissa. Yes, um, I'm available. Good evening, Mayor. Um, yes, that is possible for reimbursement um, expenses. If an applicant had uh, has hotel expenses, uh, what we normally call as lodging re lodging expenses for reimbursement, they can um, certainly apply through FEMA uh, and submit those receipts for possible reimbursement. Great. Now, this is a, 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 a different type of question, but a very important one because we often uh, get asked about tree removals in city parish government. It says trees from another yard, and I assume another property owner's yard, neighbor, fell onto our property. Is there assistance for debris removal? The estimates for tree service are $600 and up. Now, I know that's, um, <laughs> That might that might be a FEMA question, uh, but let me just start from the city parish point of view. Um, if if a tree is on uh, private property, and for example, if my neighbor's tree falls in my yard, um, I I can tell you that the city parish does not do private property uh, removal. But you're absolutely right. Tree removal and tree services are pretty hefty. So, uh, is that something that um, FEMA covers if somebody is trying to uh, uh, get, tr you know, uh, debris or tree removal? I mean, this is Stacy again. I'll take it, Barbara. Um, yes, that the debris removal or uh, cleanup assistance could could be available through FEMA. One would have to apply. Um, additionally, there is also crisis cleanup um, that's available through some voluntary agencies. Uh, and I want to go ahead and plug that number. I have it handy if that's if that's okay. Um, an applicant can call. It's a Hurricane Ida home cleanup hotline. And that telephone number is 844-965-1386. This talks about needing assistance with damages um, from Hurricane Ida. Um, they connect you with volunteers from local relief organizations and community groups and faith communities who may be able to help with um, fallen trees being cut, uh, drywall, flooring, appliance removal, tarping roofs, and mold mitigation. Okay, thank you. That was very, very helpful. Um, and before, we, we're still going to continue to take uh, questions, but I just want to let you know that we do have um, a partner on from SBA, and I'm going to uh, call on him before um, the evening is uh, 
before we continue before we complete our meeting. Uh, let's see the next question. Can I be reimbursed by FEMA for providing housing for someone else who was without power? Um, this is Barbara and. Um, well, I have to be honest and I would say probably not actually, although I agree with Stacy, we encourage people to apply. Uh, because we want to be able to review and address any possible expenses that anybody had related to the storm. But um, uh, we had folks uh, sometimes that are good Samaritans and, and then um, they uh, kind of uh, want to talk about reimbursement and typically we, we would not do that. It would need to be a, a formal uh, landlord tenant agreement. Um, so I, I would have to be honest and say probably not, but I don't want to veto it without seeing the documents. And so I would just encourage everybody to apply if you haven't already done so. Thank you very much. What is the difference between individual assistance versus critical needs assistance? How can someone qualify for either one? Well, this is Barbara and I loved that question. I thought that was a really awesome. That was, uh, so if you think about it, like FEMA has kind of three big umbrellas, individual assistance, public assistance and hazard mitigation. And so under the individual assistance umbrella are many categories or programs that exist and critical needs assistance is uh, a program that isn't a regular program. But again, uh, the state and FEMA in partnership decided that that was very important and the state of Louisiana really needed uh, their, you know, the residents needed that program. So it's it's a program that resides under the bigger umbrella of individual assistance. So I hope that helps. I think it does. If my FEMA application was denied due to incorrect information, how do I move forward with the appeals process? Did I lose everybody? No, it's it's <laughs> Stacy and I are, are both here and stuff, and I I, I want to defer to her because I I know I talk okay. a lot. Okay. okay. So so the appeals process when uh, what happens when uh, someone gets a uh, decision from FEMA uh, in our um, like in our regular program categories, it is accompanied by a letter that explains the appeal process. Um, so, and, and, you know, and, and some changes in our application are editable, uh, like, uh, 1 is current location. If someone, uh, if, when they register, they say, I'm in a shelter and then they are able to transition to, uh, a family and friends or back home. They can update that. Uh, some portions of the application are not editable. Uh, so, uh, the information would not be able to be changed once the application is made. And then if you go through the review process and, and it's not, um, however, again, let me just end where I started. If you get a decision from FEMA, um, like repair assistance, uh, is provided, then along with that will be uh, a letter that explains what the assistance was. And, and again, talks about how a person would appeal if they disagree with that assistance. So um, that really guides people through the appeal process. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, um, this question is one that I think I heard last night with our electeds. Um, or either I heard uh, Mr. Kumar uh, talk about this in, in part of his presentation. And thank you, Mr. Kumar, for the, from the uh, a small business uh, uh, um, association for being uh, agency, what SBA for be for being on our call tonight. But this is the question: My insurance company has a high deductible. The damage to my home was not enough to meet the deductible. Am I still eligible to apply for FEMA assistance? Well, I want to. Uh, Ms. Sadna respond on the FEMA's eligibility, but on the SBA side, unequivocally. That's what okay. we do. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Madam Sadna, and then I'll pick up on the SBA side if you don't mind. 
that's okay. I'll take it. This is Stacy with FEMA. Um, oh, hi, yes. No problem. Thanks, Yashil. Uh, yes, um, an applicant, if, you know, of course, if you have uh, damages that are below your deductible or, or do not fall to the category of a deductible, uh, you should apply for FEMA anyways. Um, and what we will ask is that you submit that information that you receive from your insurance company, um, that that denial or that settlement letter, and you you send that information over to FEMA so that we can determine what that unmet need is. So even if you have a high deductible um, as well, I mean, it's the same thing. If if your damages are, are um, below that, your insurance company will, of course, tell you that uh, you're not eligible through them and therefore you should continue that process with FEMA. So Madam Mayor, picking up where Stacy dropped off, um, every applicant, whether they're underinsured or uninsured, so the example that you took of is underinsured, every single person that has insurance is by definition underinsured because you'll never see an insurance company make you whole dollar for dollar, right? So. Having said that, you're automatically underinsured. So what you want to do is very specifically register with FEMA, apply with the SBA, and if approved for the loan that you're seeking, right, the deductible amount, depreciation, loss of use, things along those lines, um, you, if you qualify for that cash flow loan, there it is. Now, as I mentioned last night, you could we could increase the amount of the loan by the amount of the insurance proceeds, and by a, a a methodology called a sum of insurance proceeds, and then have the loan paid off, that PPM penalty, and the applicant could very easily have the use of the money with peace of mind. Thank you so much. You re you see, I recall the, uh, your comments from last night. Madam Mayor, it's really a privilege and, and I appreciate your remembering. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Do I have to wait until my insurance makes a decision about my damages before I apply to FEMA? This is Stacy. Absolutely not. Um, we we actually we encourage you to immediately apply. Um, you can submit that information throughout the process as soon as you receive it. Um, especially, you know, there are parts of the program as as done with this disaster that were that were turned on to mitigate critical needs for applicants. Um, and some of those programs are not dependent on income, um, such as generator assistance. You don't want to hold up that kind of assistance because it is not dependent, I said income, on insurance. <laughs> so let me clarify that. So um, yeah, absolutely not. Go ahead and apply. Thank you. I have and The same thing applies for us too. It, it applies to you guys too? Okay. So you don't yeah, have because to- because everything- you, you do not have to wait until you um, get a decision from your insurance to apply to FEMA or SBA. And let me parse those little details because as expression goes, devil's in the details. Correct, you don't need to wait, but dollars and cents are not, in my case, an SBA case, not sent out until we know that the insurance settlement is final because by, by law, we can duplicate benefits. So that's where the little detail is. Please don't hesitate, but monies that go out has to be in the form of a final payout. We know that Madam Mayor is getting 100,000 bucks. The remaining portion is 10,000 for deductible. That 10,000 is what we're looking to disperse and make sure that it's final. Noted, thank you very much. I have an unoccupied rental property with a tree down. I don't have insurance on the property. Is this covered by FEMA? I was waiting for Mr. Kramar to step in, but um, uh, because no, that if it's a rental property, unfortunately, it would not be covered by FEMA. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, by the way, Mr. Kumar is my dad, I'm Sushil, so <laughs> I love the formality. Um, uh, thank you. Um, in terms of commercial real estate, uh, any Schedule E item on your personal tax return is something that the SBA will cover for commercial real estate. Um, they're considered a business, so the maximum amount is $2 million. 
Interest rates are 2.85% fixed for a maximum 30 year term. And again, not only can they apply for physical damages, they can also apply for the loss of economic value, which is the rents that the, that the uh, tenant is paying. And then the tenant can apply for personal property with FEMA and also with the SBA. Uh, with the SBA, the maximum amount is $40,000. So that's a three for. All right. Um, I put my son on my application because he evacuated to my home and was without power for days, as well as myself. But I had a generator. His application is showing an error and won't go through. Is that because I have him listed in my home? That might be a complicated question. Let me repeat it. I put my son on my application because he evacuated to my home and was without power for days as well as myself. Okay, so, but I had a generator. His application is showing an error and won't go through. Is that because I have him listed as being in my home? Hello, Mayor, uh, this is, go ahead, Barbara. Um, it, it likely could be uh, when our system picks up on duplicate pieces of information, it, it stops it. Uh, but the helpline and we have, this is a good opportunity to say that uh, the helpline hours were expanded. And so now you can reach the helpline 24 seven. And so calling at a different time other than the day, uh, middle of the day would get you less wait time but I would recommend for that situation um, or any errors, I'm seeing a lot of things in the chat with people that are experiencing errors. Um, I would recommend calling the helpline and uh, having an agent walk through the situation and see if you can resolve it with that helpline operator during the call. Okay. If someone has a pending SNAP application, and let me be, go before I go uh, on to that, Barbara, I think that is something that everybody needs to really hone in on. If you're having challenges uh, with your online application, if it's getting bounced back, you're saying they need to talk to someone, get on the line and talk to someone, correct? I, I would recommend because it, it sounds yeah. like, again, I'm, I'm reading this in the chat that there are um, continuing frustrations trying to resolve it online. Yeah. And so I think sometimes talking to an operator is just a, a, a better way to go. Okay. Yes. Good deal. Now, moving on, this is for DCEFS. If someone has a pending SNAP application, should they apply for DSNAP? If you have a pending SNAP application, you can still apply for DSNAP. However, if you're approved for SNAP prior to your DSNAP interview, your DSNAP application would be denied. So it's really a matter about which one happens first, quite honestly. Um, but I would not pull your SNAP application back because SNAP is intended to be an ongoing support and DSNAP is a one time because of the event. So if you have a SNAP application that's pending, um, you can always, uh, reach out to us if you'd like us to follow up on your application. If you're not getting a response and it's been, you know, over 30 days, whatever the case may be, we can definitely look into that for you. But um, if it's pending, I would still apply for DSNAP. Thank you. Do evacuation expenses include groceries purchased while you were out of town? I'm assuming that was for a DSNAP as well. I couldn't tell. I don't know if that's DSNAP or FEMA. I, I couldn't tell. Do evacuation expenses include groceries purchased while out of town? So that could be maybe you guys, DCFS, or it could be FEMA. Yeah. From a, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say from a FEMA perspective, uh, that would be part of what would be intended to be addressed by the critical needs assistance. And and uh, so one would have likely filled out the application and at that screen that talks about emergency needs, they may have indicated uh, a need for food. Um, so uh, critical or emergency need uh, for food. So hopefully the critical needs assistance would address that. 
Okay. Um, Ms. Howard, did you want to add anything to that or you think that's? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, no, I think for DSNAP purposes, it would not. I don't believe it would count as an expense. So it makes sense that FEMA responded. But I just wasn't. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Okay. If you are denied for individual and household assistance with FEMA, can you still qualify for a chainsaw reimbursement? Yes, ma'am. That's a yes. My homeowner's insurance is paying for temporary housing due to extensive damage in my home. Hmm. However, I have to pay out of pocket for the deposit. Will FEMA reimburse the deposit fee? Deposit for as in an apartment or a temporary lodging? I wasn't sure what the apartment, I mean, the deposit. Basically, that's a very good question, uh, Barbara, because it says temporary housing. So temporary house, but it says a deposit fee. So when I think of deposit, I think of like, rental property or something. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, well, that's an interesting, I, I would say, rather than try to make a, a statement on the call, uh, I would encourage someone to send all their documentation uh, for their application into FEMA and allow it to be reviewed. Uh, uh, certainly when uh, someone's additional living expense uh, provision runs out, then uh, and they uh, that that's when FEMA can review to provide assistance beyond what the insurance company is able to do if if it's needed for disaster related purposes. Is that did I muddy the water? I, I'm afraid. I'm no, at... you're right. You, it was clear. It was clear. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, if your damage was due to the flood and you don't have flood insurance, do I still need to file a claim with my insurance company in order to apply for FEMA and SBA. Mayor, this is Stacy. I'll take that. Um, if you do not have insurance for flood, insurance. flood, for flood no, you do not have to file a claim. Um, you, how would you? You don't. You don't have the insurance. Yeah, that's what so I was going to say. Yeah, you could still be. Uh, you could, should still file your claim with FEMA. And don't have to submit that because you don't have that kind of that type of insurance and FEMA will ask you what types of insurance you have during the registration process. And we will take uh, the customer's word that they have no insurance also on the SBA side. Um, just for the record, for those of you all who don't know, um, but I was. Um, impacted by the 2016 flood. So some of these questions sound very familiar. Uh, I had to deal with myself, uh, but I will tell you that I um, was glad to have assistance from uh, FEMA and SBA. Just on a personal note, um, this question is for SBA. What is the interest rate on a loan for a rental property that was damaged? So I guess they're saying SBA, uh, Sushil, um, if they're getting, uh, does it make a difference if the loan is for rental property or any other property in terms of the uh, interest rate? Yes, ma'am. On the individual side, primary residences carry a different interest rate than commercial real estate, which is uh, when you have renters in. So for the applicant's question, it's 2.85% fixed for up to a maximum 30 year term. On the primary residence, it's 1.563%. Good to know. Well, I see my team is in the chat. I see other folks are in the chat. Um, Helen, Alyssa, do I have any more questions I need to answer or have asked? No, ma'am, but let me. Let me plug my own email here, Mayor. If if people have additional questions or they need some additional assistance with specific case questions, I'm going to put my email in the chat so they're welcome to reach out to me and I will get them connected um, where it's needed. But we have no other questions. What about the um, is the recovery at brla.gov email still good? 
it is available, yes, ma'am, but it will not be closely monitored. Um, so if they need anything, they can reach out to me directly. Okie dokie. Do we, so, so we're, um, we're good. Somebody says, thank you, Helen. You always rock. Got your own fan club on there. <laughs> and we're glad that we did respond uh, to the best of our ability. Listen, I want to thank all of you all for your insightful questions. I really hope that you all are our residents of uh, EBR found this session uh, helpful, that you got some knowledge and on resources and the status of our resources available to you in our um, the uh, status of our parish. I want to thank all of our partners who stayed on the call with us. Go set FEMA, the Department of Children and Family Services, the Small Business Administration, and I have to thank my team at the uh, mayor's office, all of you all, name by name, person by person, you all have been so uh, committed to serving this community and I thank you so much. Uh, this collaboration is what allows us to move throughout this process as efficiently as possible. Now, a few reminders, hurricane season unfortunately isn't over. Ensure that you and your family are red stick ready for any potential storms. A wealth of recovery information, including information on FEMA, Operation Blue Roof, debris removal, DSNAP, and countless other resources are available to you at brla.gov slash recovery. That's brla.gov slash recovery. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I pray that everyone has a speedy recovery from the storm and that you remain safe, safe throughout uh, Tropical Storm Nicholas. And remember, your city parish government is here to serve you. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Have a good evening and thank you, team. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, for Mayor. Thank you, Mayor.